Vor vier Jahren knüpfte man auf Four years ago, the whole world placed their hopes for change on the first black president of the United States. Barack Obama promised to close Guantanamo and the Iraq war, take the global leadership in alternative energies and to stand for social equality and fair taxes. Obama did not keep many of these promises, many hopes were left disappointed. He escalated the war in Afghanistan and expanded the illegal drone warfare. In the last four years, four million families in the United States have lost their homes through mortgage repossession by banks, while the financial industry profited and showered themselves with bonuses. Obama had auch den With his health system reform, Obama blocked the introduction of universal health insurance. His civil liberty policy is today seen as more restrictive than his predecessor Bush. Under Obama's presidency, more whistleblowers were jailed than under all preceding U.S. presidents combined. Amy Goodman, Vivek Shiba, Medea Benjamin, Bill McKibben, Benjamin Day and Michael Albert take stock of Obama's first term. Ersten Amtszeit Obamas. To hear these voices of people so deeply frustrated, you know, who are hearing that sucking sound of the wealth from the bottom that's going to the top faster and faster. Our country is becoming more and more unequal by the day, one of the most unequal countries in the world. And it is extremely serious. And the question is, are the Democrats taking any different view than the Republicans on this? Um, here you have President Obama, who I think campaigned on the issue of equality, and yet he surrounds himself by the bankers and their supporters in the same way that President Bush did. And so they are protected. And even as they commit massive crimes, stealing how many billions of dollars from people, those that can least afford it, who's gone to jail? Instead, they walk the power, the corridors of power in Washington, and they continue to give money so that they won't end up in jail, and they determine the way the laws are written and not written, and that is not the way it is supposed to be, and it's going to change. But we need a media that reflects the views of the majority of people in this country, not this minority elite. Well, what Obama's policies have been is basically there have been two poles to it. One is to uh, forgive all the indebtedness and the mistakes that banks made by taking their losses on to the balance sheet of the central bank. Uh, and secondly, let all the costs of the financial crisis be transferred onto the backs of working people. So what we're in now is a situation where the real and the financial sectors are both still very weak. There is what seems to be a surface level recovery. The stock market is recovered. There is some growth again. The problem is that the underlying structural conditions that led to the crisis, massive debt, massive leveraging in both the private sector and in the uh, corporate sector, uh, all of these still remain. Everybody recognizes that. Basically what's happening is a series of policies have been passed by Obama and before him by Bush, hoping for the best, hoping that they can tread water long enough for their to be some recovery in the real economy, which will pull along with it the financial sectors. In the meanwhile, uh, in the meantime, the level of unemployment is still officially at over eight percent. Unofficially, it's really closer to fifteen percent. Enormous sections of the population have basically given up looking for jobs. Retirements, pensions have evaporated, and the most amazing thing about this is that while it is fully recognized that on top of the structural problems, there was an enormous degree of corruption and rigging of the markets and evisceration of regulations and outright fraud in the banking sector. There has not been a single indictment. There is no intention to have an indictment. There is no intention to even have hearings or investigations around this. Basically, the American elite has decided that it's going to forgive itself and the rest of us are going to put the bill for it. Both for people who are uninsured and who are underinsured, um, becoming sick can lead to financial ruin um, in lots of ways. So we know that two-thirds of the people who file bankruptcy in the United States, it's due to health care issues. And we know that two-thirds of the people who lose their homes to foreclosure, that it's actually due to health care costs, that they can no longer afford their, their mortgages to pay their, their houses off. Um, 
And of course, people uh, who don't have health insurance avoid care because they can't afford it. Um, even people who have insurance, but it's not good insurance. Um, so it's, it's ruinous for people's health. Um, it literally leads to, to people dying. Uh, 45,000 people a year die because they, just because they lack health insurance. Um, it, it kills people, it makes people sicker, and it's leading to financial ruin in all of the other areas of people's lives. Uh, people's ability to afford other basic necessities like shelter and food. Um, so it is literally um, the most important economic, destructive economic force in the United States is our healthcare system. Well, you know, what happened nationally is the same thing that happened here in Massachusetts in 2006. Um, they decided to pass a bill that would only try to improve access to care slightly, um, but they didn't touch cost control because they knew as soon as they did that, the healthcare industry would fight them. So it was basically the product of trying to get people who want to improve access to care to agree with, to something that the healthcare industry uh, won't fight, um, which means that it's unsustainable. We're never going to be able to afford it. Um, it means it's never going to actually get us significant improvements in access to care. Um, and it means it's probably going to actually drive up our, our health care costs. So um, a lot of people are going to benefit from that national law, extending health insurance to those who have no health insurance, uh, to, not to all of them, but to some of them. Um, and it, it definitely addressed some of the worst excesses of our healthcare system, the things that you see on like Michael Moore documentaries of um, you know, insurance companies dropping people as soon as they become sick or refusing to cover people who have you know, chronic illnesses. Um, so I think those are, those are good steps, but it was, uh, it was really uh, a halfway measure that doesn't address the underlying problems, which is our costs are so high that we can't afford to cover everyone. Um, and we need to get, we need to uh, get this for-profit profit system, uh, for-profit companies out of our healthcare system, um, because otherwise we're never going to have uh, affordable, you know, good access to care. It's quite ironic and tragic that a president who is a constitutional lawyer and a Nobel Peace Prize winner has a session every week on Terror Tuesdays where he calls in his advisors, looks at people's profiles resembling baseball cards, and calls for nominations for people to be on the kill list and decides who will live and who will die. Uh, he is playing prosecutor, judge, jury, executioner all at once. And I think it's uh, appalling that the American people are allowing this kind of assassination to go on. There have been times in our history where uh, the government has said that the U.S. will not engage in political assassinations, that that is patently illegal. There have been times in our history where Congress comes forward and says uh, the CIA in its secret killing program is out of control and we've got to stop it. Right now we have no Congress that is stepping up to stop these illegal killings and we have a, an executive branch led by President Obama that is intimately involved with this through its own kill list. When the U.S. is there, the media pays attention, but not to people at the target end. Um, it's the people dropping the bombs. And when they leave, there's no attention paid at all. And we have to understand what happens in the wake of war, not only during war. Um, and then you have the situation in Yemen and in Pakistan where President Obama keeps a kill list himself and he personally checks off the people to be killed. I mean, you wouldn't have believed this years ago. Some of the most conservative Republican presidents, we are now at the point where President Obama is more conservative than they are. Compare President Obama to Richard Nixon. Um, it's an amazing thing to say, but he originally said he would close Guantanamo, one of his first executive orders. He said within a year, and it hasn't been closed. Um, we see the drone war expanding. And sadly, what happens if there aren't casualties, um, American casualties, people don't pay attention. And drone wars are about hitting buttons on military bases here that lead to deaths of people there. We don't want to see any casualties. I mean, I really do think that in the 21st century, war is not the answer to conflict. And we need a media that brings out the views of the peacemakers, of the diplomats, of the people who've been working for peace instead of those who wage war.
I mean, Obama's done better than George Bush, you know. Um, on the other hand, I've drunk more beer than my 14-year-old niece, you know. Um, it's not a very high bar being better than George Bush on the environment. In comparison to the size of the problem, Obama hasn't done anywhere near enough. It's been hard for him because of the Republican Congress, which has refused to go along with anything. But even where he's had a free hand, he's made a number of, a couple of good decisions, increasing mileage for cars, and a number of bad ones, opening the Arctic to drilling, for instance, or allowing the opening up of huge coal fields in the Powder River Basin, um, which will be mined and sent to China. Um, so he has not lived up to his promises. Um, he's clearly better than Bush, and he's almost certainly better than Romney. So, you know, there's, there's where you are. Yeah, I think it's really odd that it's not on the table at all. Uh, because we're having the worst weather that the U.S. has ever experienced. And it's as if these guys just don't notice. The president gave a speech in June in Pennsylvania, and it was so hot that like 15 or 20 people passed out during the speech watching him. But he didn't even acknowledge that it had happened, <laughs> much less that it was related to the record heat that was you know, sweeping the country. Um, we're, I think, reaching the point where they're going to have to start talking about this stuff. The new polling shows that 70% of Americans now understand that the climate is changing. For America, that's a lot. I mean, you know, half the country still thinks that, you know, Elvis is alive someplace. So, I mean, you know, to get 70% agreement on anything is pretty good. Um, people know because they can see with their own eyes. There's a couple of things that I think people have to have learned from uh, the last uh, over the last decade, one is that uh, the issues of the economy and the uh, the military are much bigger than any individual in the White House. Uh, that those who thought that when President Obama came in there would be major changes were sorely disappointed and had to learn that uh, the military industrial complex is uh, overwhelming, that it is huge, that war has its own momentum, and there uh, is a group that profits from war and wants to see perpetual war. Uh, and to stop it, it's, mu it's not enough to elect a new person to the White House. There has to be an independent movement, independent from party politics. Um, the other thing is to recognize that Barack Obama was always a centrist, that he kept the same people uh, in charge of the economy that the Bush administration had, the same people from Wall Street. And that's also true of the military. In fact, he kept the exact same person in to run the military uh, that George Bush had. So he did not come in uh, trying to make major shakeups in the two most important pieces of our uh, country, which would be the economy and the military. Uh, he came in on a path of continuity. But then, what you had on the opposite side is a nice-looking, nice-talking, uh, very articulate uh, black man. And for the U.S. to have a black president for the first time made a lot of people feel very proud and very afraid to protest against him. So some would say that for the establishment, for the 1% that runs the economy and the war, President Obama was really a, a dream gift. Obama will get up and give a speech that sounds remarkably social democratic and there will be a lot of caring and well-meaning leftists um, in the United States and around the world who will say okay well he was hamstrung in his first term but he's now understood that and he's now going to fight back. You know, in other words, they're wrong. I'm pretty sure they're wrong. We should say one other thing. You could imagine that happening. Right. A lot of leftists can't conceive of that happening. So take Venezuela. Uh, uh, Chavez wins. In his campaign, he, this is his initial campaign, he runs and he um, appeals to working people. He appeals to the great 
you know, the large majority of the Venezuelan population, 80% of the population even, you know. And he wins the election by appealing and by saying he's going to make things better, he's going to, you know, reduce the pain and the hardship and the suffering that's associated with income differentials and so on. He wins. Um, he gets into office. So that's a little bit like Obama wins. Now, Chavez's rhetoric went further than Obama's rhetoric. But it could have been all rhetoric, right? Um, he gets into office, and he confronts exactly what Obama would have confronted if Obama had... had so in other words, Chavez gets into office and says, I'm going to do what I said I was going to do. And he's sitting in a room with the big power brokers of Venezuela. In essence, you can, you can, you can conceive of this. And they say, what are you talking about? What are you talking about? You're, you're our president. We, we, we let you be president. We didn't attack you. We, we didn't, you know, marshal our energies to prevent you from coming to office. You're beholden to us. You're now going to follow through with policies that benefit us. And Chavez said back, no, I'm not. You know, you can imagine him saying back, no, I'm not. I'm going to do exactly what I said I was going to do. And then there's this war between um, the federal government and the old governors, and the old mayors, and the police, and the owners, um, and, and for that matter, many of the religious hierarchy, and so on and so forth. Um, so you could imagine that in the United States. Just imagine that Obama had been somewhat to the left of where he was verbally, and in his promises, and if he got into office, and whether it was an outgrowth of his true nature, or whether it was because he was stubborn, he said to the powers that be, I'm going to follow through on what I said. And they said, no, you're not. And they started to attack him. And he decided to fight back. That's what Chavez did. Right? And now you have a process in Venezuela that goes further and further at its core, at the Bol Bolivarian, you know, ironically, the top of the government. Not all through the government, but the top of the government goes further and further left. You could imagine that. And so the fact that some people in the United States thought that that might be in the offing, they were confused, but I don't think, you know, you don't consign them to the ash can of history because they made a mistake. You know, okay, they made a mistake. They misread what was likely. To misread it a second time is a little less, you know, is even more confused and deluded, but again, all right, so some people are going to make that mistake. I think people are pretty uh, are are getting um, pretty savvy to the fact that Obama is not going to make major changes. That he is a politician first and foremost that's concerned about keeping power for himself and for his party, and that he uh, is not uh, a bold change maker when it comes to uh, the these issues of war and the economy. Uh, he might do some good things around social issues. Uh, he has, for political reasons, suddenly come out in favor of gay marriage, uh, given something to the immigrant community that's better than perhaps they could get from the Republicans, uh, allowed gays to serve in the U.S. military. But those are all minor things. When it comes to these major issues, I don't think we're going to get much change from President Obama in the next couple of years, unless there is a movement that can regroup, unless the Occupy movement can rebuild itself, the anti-war movement can rebuild itself, uh, can get over their fear of protesting a black president, uh, and can really start putting pressure on this administration, then we'll see some change.